it, it, uh, it becomes advantageous to deviate from the mechanism and, for instance, have not pure counter rotations, but uh, uh, rotations, consequent, subsequent rotations. And then you can combine both the nonlinear mechanics, the buckling, and, uh, and the special decay, and you get solitons. And so do you have any questions on what, were dis on what was discussed yesterday? All right, well, if not, let's move on to today then. Uh, <coughs> and today we'll switch gears, so we won't do much geometry. The geometry will, will remain quite plain, uh, but we'll just play with how we actually inject energy. Uh, so usually in what I showed you before, we actually you know, compress these objects from the outside, so we load it from the outside. Uh, and here uh, we actually do work from the inside, and we will do work in such a way that you can keep, you, you have to revise your elastic description of your, your dynamical matrix description, so that makes uh, interesting uh, concepts that you have to think about, for instance, matrices that are non-symmetrical anymore, uh, which I think is quite uh, nice. Uh, and I think more, most broadly, this is yeah the field of active metamaterials. So you engineer this behavior by engineering how you inject energy, and this is basically one of the examples we have in, in my lab. Uh, this is a ring that's made of uh, 12 vertices. It's laying on the air table, so we have made our own air table that blows air up. And what we did here, we, we tilt a bit the table such that you have uh, some gravity, not the gravity of Earth because our motors are too weak, but kind of the gravity of the moon. <laughs> and so, uh, and what, what, you show, what you see here is that this object uh, can basically move by itself, undergo uh, spontaneous cycles of shape changes. Let me see if I can, yeah. Uh, so it, it's interesting, you have like some nonlinear waves happening inside, and as a result of those nonlinear waves, you have like shape changes, uh, and as a result of the shape changes, you have a, an object that locomotes by itself, okay? And so why would you want to do that? Well, uh, I think this is potentially uh, introducing new, uh, new concepts that could be useful for robotics. So, you know, robots are great. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the, maybe one of the most state-of-the-art robots you can think of, the Mars rover. But, you know, you, the Mars rovers, you have to tell it what to do, right? And if, if you don't know the environment or if you cannot really access the robot easily, like in Mars, right, if the, if the wheel gets stuck in the, in the sand, uh, well, it doesn't really know. So, uh, actually, there's an example of a, ro of a rover that got stuck like for six weeks, just because he was he was stuck in sand, uh, right? And and, uh, uh, and so, it's it's potentially interesting to have uh, objects like that can navigate their environment by themselves, right? Uh, this is another example, maybe more futuristic. Uh, imagine robots that you would want to deploy in the body. There also, you could imagine that deploying the body, you would have very unpredictable and easy, hard to access terrain for the robots to evolve. So then it's potentially interesting to have some, some tricks to actually have the robot be uh, robust and do things by itself, okay? Uh, then this brings me a bit to the field of active matter because active matter is actually uh, a class of material that do things by themselves. So this is actually one of the iconic example uh, that has been around for a few years. These are a bunch of uh, biological fibers that are constantly steered by molecular motors. And as a result, they exhibit this kind of yeah, shape, shape, cycles of shape changes here that are uh, beautiful. Uh, but here, you know, it's nice, it's pretty, but it doesn't really do anything, right? So, uh, uh, you know, robots do, do things, but you have to tell them what to do, uh, active matter, you know, does thing by itself, but doesn't really do much. Uh, so the question, the question here that we want to ask, or the, the more general approach is, could we combine, could we blur the boundaries between the words of active matter and the word of robotics? Okay? Uh, and so this is maybe how I could, should define an, act, an active mechanical metamaterial. So this is really, a, uh, you know, you have a bunch of springs uh, and masses. So the masses are connected by the springs. 
And then you have some form of engine of chemical reaction that is, uh, that is able to create a force or inject energy, okay? And, uh, and then the question is, okay, uh, what is the relation between how you inject the force and what you get out, right? And so these are a few examples of uh, platforms, experimental platforms that people have developed. So this is from our lab, uh, you know, very similar to the, 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 um, uh, the first um, uh, ring I showed you, except here it's now a lattice. Uh, you have other examples of metamaterials here. It's more for propagating waves. So this is a, a plate that vibrates on which you have piezo actuators and sensors. Uh, and you have also, uh, uh, for instance, you can think of another approach here. This is a bunch of grains that keep on dilating and compressing. And, and, and they have the little magnets that make them glue together. And together, they can move towards a, a light source, for instance. So these are you know, a far from exhaustive list of things, uh, uh, of ways in which you could r realize this concept here. OK? And uh, if we go to this, uh, you know, theoretically, that's how you can think about those objects, right? So you have the acceleration of these nodes. And all these nodes, they have you know, damping forces, elastic forces that come from the rubber bands. And they might have some active force, right? And the active force here might depend on time. So that's what, for instance, they have in these green grains. They clock. They have like a, a oscillations, right? But uh, what we do is, or what, what you could also think of, is active force that don't necessarily depend on time explicitly, but can depend on the displacement of the node and of its neighbor, or on the velocity of the node and of its neighbor. Right? And the name of the game here is really, OK, uh, what should I put here? Right? <laughs> what, kind of, uh, what, what can I do there? And what is interesting to do? And you know, there's, I think, infinitely many things you could do. Right? And so what I will show you here uh, today is a, a few examples, uh, but it's really a, a recent uh, field of, of, of uh, options you can follow there. If you, you know, uh, and so, but in principle, yeah, how, do, how you, the question here is how do you navigate that space and how do you, then how do you design for something that's interesting and then how do you describe the emergent properties that you have, okay? If you linearize these forces, so you assume that the force is linear in V, uh, 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 nu, and, and, and then you can decompose this onto uh, matrices. So we had, we talked a lot about the dynamical matrix, so this blue theorem, this is what we discussed so far, also Xiaoming and Tom uh, discussed this. Right, you have a you know uh, acceleration is equal to the elastic forces which you cover, uh, which you encode by this dynamical matrix here. Right, you might have the same if you have a damping, right? Although usually we have very similar form, a very uh, simple form of damping where this gamma here is just a diagonal matrix, right? And then with activity, you know, this is a, a few examples of things you could have. You could have a constant force that oscillate that, for instance, depends on the time. Or you could have, uh, you know, still also something that depends on the on the displacement. So you can still have uh, make it very similar to the dynamical matrix, and you could do the same for damping. Okay. So these are this is maybe what what is useful to do. And you know, in, usually in active matter, it's mostly people mostly consider fluids. So fluids, they don't have a reference state. So you cannot really linearize. Uh, you know, you can linearize the dynamic around the steady state. But the steady state, you have to figure it out. Here, uh, you know, there's a well-defined de well reference state uh, because these springs have a well-defined uh, re uh, rest length, right? And so that means that these you can actually linearize around the rest position of this lattice here. And that's what, that's what you can do here. And that, that, that also means that uh, you can do a linear physics a bit more easily than in a usual active matter, active fluid. OK? So now I'll just cover uh, two examples, uh, one example quickly. So what happens, for instance, if you if you uh, use time modulation, and that's what people have done here. So uh, this is uh, in the group uh, of Chiara de Rayo in Caltech, where they have a, a bunch of nodes that can slide on the rod, and uh, each of the nodes is actually a magnet, and so uh, if they modulate the current in the coil they can actually change in time the stiffness that of, of the spring that connects each node to the ground, OK? And they can do that with the modulation that, with the spatial, with the temporal modulation. So they oscillate this in time. 
but also with a, 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 a wavelength. So they have a spatial temporal fatter uh, wave, basically, that, uh, that modulates the wave. And to do this, so then that brings this red term here. And basically, they show that if you, if you send a wave, if you have a, a spatial temporal modulation here that, that resonates with the wave that you send, basically you can send waves more in prefer preferentially in one direction rather than in the other. Okay, so th that's one, that's actually a game a lot of people play in uh, metamaterials, optical metamaterials, and so on. So that's really, uh, you know, kind of the, the connection between active mechanical metamaterials and the other uh, part of metamaterial could be, uh, is, is pretty much done at this level because it's often what people do, you know, in, uh, you know, photonics or cold atoms. They just send a laser that oscillates in time, right? So that, that, that's, that's typically, uh, that's typically the <laughs> pretty much the only thing they can do. Um, um, uh, you can also do uh, play a similar game. So that's actually a, a group from uh, uh, a work from my colleague uh, across the street at Amov, Bas Overvelde. What they do, they have kind of a, a little robot that has a, an actuator here, and the actuator can change its length. And so here they're able to change the rest length of the spring that connects two actuators. And so basically, uh, you know, you have a bit of friction because these things move on the ground. And then you have a, an extra term here that is modulated in term in, in time, right? And then what you could, you, could, you could also use a spatial temporal modulation. Uh, or I think what they did here is actually to learn it, to use like a very basic machine learning algorithm to uh, you know, optimize the locomotion of that, of that chain. Right? So these, these are, I think, you know, two basic examples. There's many more examples of, of things you can do if you play with time modulation. Okay? What I want to do uh, next is to go beyond that and uh, not do time modulation, but I want to I wanna have this term here. Uh, I want to play with that term, so a term that I can you know, factor in the dynamical matrix, because uh, the initial motivation was a bit more to ask, OK, what happens if your dynamical matrix is not symmetrical? What kind of waves emerge? Okay. But to do that, you need somehow to inject a force depends on the states of the system itself. So you need to be able to have sensors uh, and processors and actuators that can you know, measure you and apply a force that depends on, on you at every single time. Right? Uh, we have done this. This is uh, you know, one of the examples of the uh, building block that we use in the lab. Uh, this is a, a three-bar linkage. Uh, so you have a, a one hard linkage, one other hard linkage, one other hard linkage. They are connected by an elastic band. But below this elastic band, what you have is motors, sensors, Arduinos. And so what we can do is you know, uh, 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 measure, for instance, the, the angle here with an uh, and then pass it on to this guy and use the, the Arduino to control the torque on this guy that is proportional to that guy. Okay. And then we can do the same here. We measure the angle here. We apply a torque. But then what we do, we, we also apply a torque that's proportional to the angle uh, of this guy here, but with a minus sign. And you can see that if we have this minus sign here, uh, well, then we uh, become, uh, uh, we have our, our matrix that becomes non-reciprocal. Okay? And so this is what happens when you do uh, actually the, Experiment, let's see. Yes. If I push from the left, it moves out on the right, right? Uh, and if you had a purely elastic system, you would expect a symmetrical response. But now uh, I programmed it to be non reciprocal, to be odd. So if I push from the right, it actually goes in on the left. Okay? So I have here essentially a very basic building block that has this asymmetry that I was interested in having. And I guess the rest of the talk today is to try to show you that it's interesting to do that. Right? <laughs> uh, and it's potentially an interesting approach to actually make uh, robots. OK? So let's maybe come back to a more textbook example. We had uh, masses and sprigs. Oh, yes? What happens when you, uh, what happens when you apply a force at the same time from both directions? Um, what do you want to know exactly? So, yeah. is it then going out or in? The so yeah, ju ju just what what happens when you 
compress them at the same time. Which directions do they move? Uh, how does the force the curve looks time. like? Uh, so one, you know, you move this what arm, this one is going to want to move out, right? But if you move this one, this one is going to move in. So on the left, on the left guy, on my left guy, you will uh, not need a, a lot of force. You would actually maybe you have to retain it, but this guy will have to ex exert a lot of force, right? So somehow you will still be able to you know, move the arms, but then you will feel an asymmetry in the, in the force you have to apply on, you, in each, on, your, on your hands, on each of your hands to do this. Right? Interestingly, if you now do this, and then this, and this, and then this, then, you know, if I do this, then this guy's gonna want to move out, so I will have to uh, overcome a lot of work to do this. But then if I do this, it's the same. So if I do in, in, in that sequence, I will have to inject a lot of work. But if I do it in the reverse sequence, first this, then this, actually, this will give me work. Wow. Right? And so you see that actually this non-reciprocity uh, has a direct consequence on uh, you know, the, the, the work, uh, you know, the, the, the direction of the cycle of the shape change that you, uh, that you imply will directly you know, one of them will, will give you work, and one of them will ask you to do a lot of work, right? And, and actually, the, we'll see later that actually the, the, the direction that does work is actually the one that could be used for these autonomous shape changes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is a, this is a very similar implementation here. I could actually, you know, this is a, a chain of springs. And if I wanted to realize it in the lab, I could put each of my uh, three bar linkage below here, right? Uh, and this would actually directly, uh, you know, so I would, I would make my three bar linkage but connect a spring in between. Then I could really have a, such an object. And this object is a chain of springs, so like pretty much like the one that Xiaoming treated in her lecture uh, on Wednesday. But uh, on Wednesday or, no, yesterday maybe. Uh, uh, except that here, each of the springs, they break Newton's third law, right? So th these are the springs that if I, if I push on you with such a spring, you would feel more force than I would. So you break this action-reaction law, right? And to do that, you know, you can, there's no free lunch. You cannot do that for free. You need actually a, an extra you know, devil behind that actually injects linear momentum, right? You cannot break Newton's third law without injecting momentum, right? Actually, we don't really break Newton's third law. We just decide to ignore <laughs> the, the yellow part here that, that injects the momentum, right? OK? And so uh, if you do that. Say it again, how, how you do that? Well, imagine, imagine, uh, imagine I have this guy, but now I, I uh, attach a little spring between the two ends of the arms, and, and, I, I, and I connect many of them, right? Effectively, you know, I ignore the, the part here, but effectively the, the, the subsystem here that consists of the masses connected by springs uh, realizes this model. Okay, I see. Yeah? Um, okay. And so now that's nice because I can actually, you know, do my textbook, you know, do my look, look come back to my textbook condensed matter, right, and, and actually look. And so uh, this is what you have when you do uh, when you do the, the math. I guess it's Friday, we're a bit lazy, so may maybe you're tired, so maybe I, I don't do the writing. Is it okay? Or, or you prefer me to do the writing on the board? It's the same. I put it on the slide because it's, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> uh, so this is the same. So we have that equation, of, you know, Newton's law, right? Uh, so acceleration here, this is the force of the usual spring that you have, right? But then here we have this weird force that has a asymmetry, so you know you have a force that is proportional to the displacement of the left neighbor minus the displacement of the right neighbor. Okay. Okay. And uh, so this is nice. If we now that what we want to do, I want to ask, okay, what is the dynamics of this object? What is the response of this object to waves? So we'll switch gear. We haven't done any waves. Uh, Xiaoming has done the waves, 
But to do this, what you typically do is you, you make a, a non-zats of a plane wave, right? Of plane waves. Right? And so that's what you assume that uh, the displacement at every single node is, is equal to exponential i omega t minus q i. <coughs> okay? So you assume that the solutions of these equations are plane waves. Okay? Why is yeah. Uh, well, if I show off, uh, this may be because I'm sloppy in my notation. Because uh, I, later we go in the continuum limit, and the continuum limit, uh, then you, you you make this become a uh, you make this become a, a partial differential uh, of of x of x. Yes, yeah. Actually, I can do that also. Yeah, just write that. But so this is what you what you do. Uh, this is what we've done also with learning. You actually uh, inject this in the, in this equation, right? Uh, and then uh, what you get is an algebraic equation that will give you a relationship between the frequency here and the wave vector here, okay? And that's what people do when they solve for waves, and that's what you do when you want to look at band structures, okay? And so that's what we do. And if you do that, you see that, you know, the, the, this term will have given you uh, omega square. This term will have given you uh, exponential IQ plus exponential minus IQ. And so the sum uh, gets cosine. Oh, here we can also add a A. Well, this is the lattice spacing. OK. This is uh, the wave vector. Right, and this is the frequency. OK. And so what you find here is that uh, you, have a, you have a frequency square that has this term that depends on, the, on k. But this term depends on, actually, is imaginary. You see here you have an imaginary number. Right? And the imaginary number comes here from the fact that we had a, a minus sign. You know? So because you know, exponential iq minus exponential minus iq is actually 2i times sine. And so this asymmetry here that we had, this oddness that we had, is really the one that is introducing here this imaginary component, right? OK? Uh, I can also play the, ju just as an aparté, I can also look at the continuum limit here. <coughs> like we did yesterday, right? So the continuum limit is to assume I plus 1 is i of x plus minus. So I have a, I'm going to assume the lattice spacing to be 1. OK, I can, I can assume this and inject it in the equation up, right? And when I do this, what I get is this. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and so you see that when I'm not odd, when k prime is zero, I have a wave equation. So this is actually how you get your wave. You can de derive your wave equation in this textbook, right? This is the wave equation. Here, you see that the, 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 the non-reciprocity, what it did is actually introduced a uh, first order term, right? Uh, and this first order term breaks this left right symmetry and actually has a, yeah, it's, it's kind of the, what will have the, the role of, the, of this sign here, of this 2i sign here, okay? Okay, good. So what I can do, <coughs> Uh, what I can do now is I can actually solve and look at the eigenfrequencies of this object. But we know that here, you know, the, the omega typically gives me the frequencies of the waves. 
But now you see that since I have this imaginary term here, omega will have also a, will be complex, right? And so what does it mean to have a complex omega? Yeah, some decays or some blow up, right? So what I can do <coughs> is I can uh, actually solve for this equation. So that's what I will do. So I express omega as a function of, actually I in the slide after, I, I expect omega of q, but then I, I, I considered, I was working in this continuum limit, uh, where, so continuum limit, Uh, of the dispersion relation is omega is 2. So then continuum limit means the wave vector is small, OK? So the, the assuming that you have a, a small wave vector means you have large wavelength. And large wavelength means that uh, you have a slow spatial variations. And so when you do that, what you find is uh, is exactly Q square, A square plus I'm going to remove the A's, OK? And so then, uh, well, then when you take the square root, that's what you find here, right? Uh, you, you don't need to do that. You don't need to take the continuum limit. But somehow, the expressions are a bit easier. And it doesn't really change what I was going to say. And then what you can do is you can look at omega. And so you're interested into the, at, at the imaginary part of omega because that's the one that tells you whether your waves are going to blow up or die, right? And you see here, I can plot this. So I can plot, for instance, I, can, I take a positive value of k prime. I can plot the imaginary part of omega. And what I find is that some parts of those waves have a positive imaginary wave. Actually, those waves will blow up. And some part of the, uh, of the waves will have a negative imaginary part. So these waves will die, OK? So now, if I want to know which waves will blow up and which waves will die, I have to look at the group velocity. So the group velocity, uh, you get by taking the derivative of, of this is a typo. This should be a q, not a k, right? So the, sorry about that. So the group velocity. is vg omega dq, right? And so you know which ways are going to, you know which ways go forward when, they, when the waves that go forward are the ones that have a positive real part of the group velocity, right? So, so and you see that here, uh, well, if I look at this positive wave vector here, actually, all those waves, regardless of the sign of k prime, uh, have a positive real part of the group velocity, so that means there's a forward waves, right? And, uh, and you see that when k prime is positive, the forward waves are the ones that are amplified, and the backward waves are the ones that are dissipated, OK? So this is very, you know, this is just a wave, uh, let's say, physics to just simply state that you know, when the, the springs push stronger in one direction, they will amplify the wave in one direction. So, so at the end of the day, it's, it's quite simple. But that's kind of the tools that are useful to describe these active metamaterials, to describe these waves based on this uh, uh, dispersion relation. OK? Uh, you might, this is maybe the simplest scenario, but if you add you know, next nearest neighbor springs and so on, then you get slightly less intuitive uh, scenarios that are also useful. OK? Is that all clear? Yep. OK. Uh, and so now what you can do is what we did then. Uh, you can go in the lab and study those waves. And that's what we did. And uh, you know, this is a, an example of what you see. You poke it in the middle. The forward propagating waves will be amplified. And the backward propagating waves will be attenuated. And that's why you see this behavior here. OK? <coughs> Yeah. Hi. What's the limit on the uh, amplitude of the fluctuations which would start the propagation of the wave? Uh, uh, any, any small perturbation will do. It doesn't. Yeah, but I have friction in here, right? 
So I have okay, some linearities so and so, so on. That, there. That's what's limiting the. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in theory, for my the model before, yeah, any wave would just blow up, right? And uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's what's also interesting here, perhaps, is you know when we looked at the topological modes that Charming discussed, the zero frequency, only the zero frequency was in edge mode, right? Here, all the modes are edge modes, right? All, all the modes localized at the edge, right? Because they all are biased. They all have an imaginary part that is positive regardless of their frequency, right? So this is very extreme behavior, a very extreme version, you know, very extreme, let's say, uh, counterpart of this edge mode that really comes from the fact that we have this bias that drives the system. You know, yeah. one, one comment here that I want to just say is that this is actually, this looks a bit special, but imagine you had uh, diffusion instead, instead of waves. So diffusion would be something like this with the first derivative, right? This actually is well known. This is called advection diffusion. OK? And that's what you get if you have a fluid flow. Uh, uh, you know, if you would look at the motion of particles in the fluid flow, right? Uh, that is advected. So actually, uh, you know, maybe we make a fuss about the inertial case, but in a non-inertial case, in the, uh, then you really have a bit of a you know, diffusion plus a bit of the advection, right? And the flow here is really what what biases your dynamics. I have two questions. One is, what happens if you increase the, the, the length? Because it seems that the, the, the <coughs> sign is amplified. Mm -hmm. Then at a certain point, you have some, uh, I don't know, an exponential growth. What does, it ha what does it happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then, uh, but then you have nonlinear effects, which you... Yes, okay. yes, which I will discuss later. Yeah. Okay. And the yeah. second question is, how, what about uh, energy balance? Because you have those active stuff. Yeah. You are introducing and injecting energy. Yeah. So you're not producing anything. I mean, I hope. I, I hope you're not. Uh, no, no, the no, thermodynamics no, no. still works. No, here. no, no. Energy is so not constructed. You require an energy source to do this. Yes. Right. But then, yes. uh, how, is the ba how energy is balanced there? So this means that you are introducing energy everywhere in the same amount. And then, once you disturb in the middle, the energy goes to one side. Is it right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, there's some form of symmetry in that system, because you see that the the, dissipate, the positive imaginary part is symmetrical to the negative part. So there's an interesting symmetry that you know, in the spectrum, in the in the spectrum, at least as much energy is injected as is attenuated, right? Only you know, only the forward waves take out the energy, and and the and uh, the, the forward waves you know are, are amplified, and the backward ones are attenuated. Uh, but of course, you know, when, when the system, when the dynamic grows, then at some point the, 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 the backward waves anyway don't exist anymore because they're died, right? So then the, the forward waves keep on, you know, sucking energy from the, from the battery of, of this thing or from the wires. But if, 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 your if, if your system is big enough at a certain point, uh, yeah. could you keep on, on, on having energy from the, those particles which are very far away? Because, you know, there's going to be attenuated the energy on the on the yeah. left side uh, if, if if you keep this model yes it's could be a layer one way maybe i like to think about this this is active force right so you know the the work of this active force is really active force times displacement right and you see here perhaps that the the work depends on the gradient of the displacement right right but I don't, doesn't really answer your question, but at least maybe, at least it helps me try to figure So here you really see that if you have positive gradients of displacement or negative gradients of displacement, you have a different sign of the work that will be. Uh, that, that oh, right, will but be, I mean, yeah. so, but yeah. because the, the sign, yeah. the, the signal is, is dissipated or does not pass through that direction, yeah. you stop having energy from, that, yeah. from those particles yes. at a certain point if you yeah. have a very. Okay. Yeah, well, actually. Actually, no, because imagine I didn't have, uh, uh, I didn't have uh, friction. I didn't have friction, I didn't have damping. Imagine that. Well, then these waves will go here, but they will decay in amplitude when they go here. But then they will bounce back, 
and then they will bounce back and amplify as they bounce back, but then attenuate and bounce back, but then so you will have like a, a standing wave, but the standing wave is asymmetric, right? Which is weird, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Uh, that's actually what I wanted to uh, discuss here. So one way to think about this is to describe you know, a finite system, right? So if you describe a finite system, uh, this, is, uh, this is how you describe it. You have a dynamical matrix. It's uh, like a very simple dynamical matrix. It, it's like, you know, uh, uh, invariant by a translation, so it's the same uh, terms. Actually, these matrices are called tuplets matrices. Uh, uh, and uh, when you have an open chain, this is the ma matrix you have to solve. Okay? Actually, I wanted to have it as an exercise but we're all tired, so let's skip the exercise for today. Yes? Uh, I have just a simple question in your answer to of plane waves. You told that you have dumping, that is, uh, imagine a complex number of frequency in time. Mm -hmm. So you have a dumping time. Mm -hmm. I think you, you would have also a dumping in space, you have an exponential in QE. Perhaps mm, the solution could yeah, be yeah, different. Yeah, 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 that's true. Actually, yes, good point. Here, if, this I, the, yeah, yeah. if I have my dispersion relation here, I can, so, I can solve, you know, omega of Q, which means when I solve omega of Q, that means, hey, assume I have a Q vector, so I assume I have a, a standing wavelength, what, what is this wave, standing wave gonna become, right? And what, I, what we saw is that the waves, depending on, the, on their wavelength, on the wave vector, the standing waves will be either attenuated or amplified depending on their group velocity. But I could actually do something else. That's what you're suggesting, right? I could, I could solve Q of omega, right? right? So here, assuming, for instance, that I have a, a frequency of the wave, how does it look like spatially, right? And I can actually answer that question by just solving this equation here. And when I do solve this equation here, I find exponentially decaying waves that look like this, right? So that are standing waves, but that are all skewed and asymmetric, right? So this is really, I mean, essentially that uh, should have been a basic wave physics, but uh, it took me a while to actually uh, understand how you should think about this, yeah. So these are really how to, you know, once you have your dispersion relation, that's really how you, the two ways in which you can look at them. Yeah? And maybe it also answers a bit uh, some of the questions you had. You can do that, you know, with the dispersion relation, but you can also do that, uh, you know, numerically uh, as an exercise. So to computation, look at the eigenvalues and the vectors of those matrices. It's a bit more boring, less satisfying, but it, I guess it's good for the soul to do this thing sometimes, to you know, go to Python, Mathematica, and solve those, right? And if you do this, uh, what you find is that there's, a, there's, a weird, there's something weird going on. It's not only that the, all the waves are asymmetric, because imagine my medium is periodic. So my med if my medium is periodic, I have this here, these two terms that connect the two ends of the medium. My, you know, I know that when I have a wave that propagating forward, it will amplify it. In the case where the chain was open, it was bouncing back and forth and giving this kind of profile here that was exponentially decaying here, right? But when I don't have an edge, I, but that's because I had an edge that would make it back and, uh, that was making it back, bounce back and forth. Now, when I don't have an edge, there's nothing that will prevent it to go, go around and keep on amplifying forever, right? So. This means that, you know, before I could, I could not amplify my waves anymore because there was a stationary wave that was keeping on bouncing back and forth, but somehow since I had these edges, it couldn't amplify, right? So therefore my spectrum here was purely real. And my, my standing waves here were skewed, as I was saying. So they, they all became this, uh, this edge mode, if you wish, at, regardless of the frequency. However, when you maybe, when you have this open chain, when you have this periodic chain here, the, the, the modes are no more phonons, if you wish, but you know, half of them amplifies and Good. half of them dies, and they do that forever. 
Yeah. What is in the x axis? X axis? Ah, here it's space. So this is really the shape of an eigen oh. mode, right? So this is really, uh, you know, yeah, eigen mode. So this is really the, the displacement u versus the, the, the space i, right? And here what I do is I plot, I make a parametric plot of this, of, of the dispersion relation. I'm, is it very different from uh, the result with the open chain? Is it very different if you have a, a chain, a chain of a normal uh, springs? Yes, it is very different. And uh, yeah. wait, wait, wait. But but then you put a force, a periodic force. Yeah. Uh, would not you see something similar? Um, uh, I don't think so. I wouldn't know. I mean, if you would have to revise your wave. Analysis when you have a periodic force because then you need to do Floquet theory and so on, so it's, it would be a bit slightly more involved. But typically, you don't have this. No, typically your spectrum. Typically, what it does when you have a, a, a like like the first example of the Caradarius group, it just shifts a bit your your dispersion relation, but that's it. Or, or, or it actually, it makes copies of your dispersion relation. So you really need the non-reciprocity to have that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and so, you know, this is strange, right? Because you only, you know, it's like, it looks like a tiny change to your matrix <laughs> only this, but somehow the effect is huge. It's very, really, it's really, uh, and so, and two comments. So first of all, we, we are surprised about this, but mathematicians know, know this from the, 90s, so there are books on spectral properties of two-place matrices, uh, but they're a bit, you know, they're a bit uh, difficult. I had a I had a master student who was doing his diploma in between math and physics. We had him study this, but I, I you know, it was even it was hard for me to follow, uh, you know, his arguments about uh, you know <laughs> spectral properties. Uh, but you know, the fact that you have this weird, this very strong dependency on the boundary conditions, or even if you had a tiny defect, you also make really strongly change the spectrum is really something that's quite strange. Um, and uh, the people who do edge modes and topological physics, that, like the, the type of physics that uh, Xiaoming described, really got excited about this because somehow, you know, this is an edge mode, but the edge modes live at all the frequency, not only the band gap. And you have a very strong discrepancy between the open, the spectrum of the open chain and closed chain, usually when you do topological physics, you rely on the fact that the spectrum of the open chain and the closed chain is actually not that different. <laughs> and here, here you, you so this bulk boundary correspondence kind of breaks down. Uh, and so uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's what, you know, interested people. But actually, I will, I will show you next that it doesn't really, it, does only, it doesn't only break down, but there's a new version of the bulk boundary correspondence that is purely active that you can actually formulate also. Okay? Um, and so that's what I will uh, discuss here, in fact. Um, uh, and that's what, that's what we did, in fact. Uh, so we, we took this uh, kane lubeski chain and we made it odd. We made it non-reciprocal. And so you just take the same chain that we described before, but then you just have the springs been uh, like this, odd, okay? Uh, and then what's interesting about this is we knew we know from, from Xiaoming that you have always a, an edge mode in the middle of the band gap, right? But before, in the topological physics, we just were not looking at imaginary axis. We are just looking at this axis here, right? And, and, uh, you know, and we know that there's a point here that represents the topological edge modes in this kane lubeski chain. And that when we change the angle here, the, the edge mode is always there, but it goes from one side to the other, okay? Now there's something you know, and that's, that's what, for an open chain and a closed chain, it doesn't really matter because the spectrum when you're passive is the same. But now I told you that when I'm active, my spectrum becomes completely different because it becomes imaginary, complex, right? And so uh, you see here that there's actually a regime that we could find, depending on how non-reciprocal you are, that go, will go, take you from, you know, spectrum being looking like this, like two blobs, but at some point you increase your non-reciprocity and the two blobs will merge and make up one blob, right? Even though you see the, the red spectrum of your, you know, open chain and the, 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 
passive counterpart would not change much, but you have this kind of topological transition that characterizes you know, what happens when you go from a, when you, when you, you have this closing transition here. Yeah? The colors here is the spectrum of your open chain in blue and the spectrum of your closed chain in red. So the green green curved lines represent the non-reciprocal yeah. uh, thing you put in, and uh, how how did you exactly add it to the rotors? Is it the, using the Arduino yeah, rotor? Yeah, Arduino microcontroller. So it's the same type of non-reciprocal coupling as that exactly. uh, first one D chain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Except, I see. Except okay. that before we have the one band system, but now we have a two band system, right? So I guess. That's and uh, from the first case where you have two circles. Then to the second case, it becomes one circle. M maybe uh, what, what, what exactly was changed? Um, so what changes is that, uh, uh, let me try to draw it here. Uh, let me see. So if you have the real spectrum for the Ken Lubezki chain, you get this, right? Right? Yes. But now I can also do it uh, for the imaginary part. Right? And now I have to think. Uh, so when you have an imaginary part, I think what you get is something like this, probably. Right? When in the first scenario, right? And so this makes a, this makes a two loops, right here. You see? Yeah, that's uh, the uh, yeah. periodic. That's, uh, yeah, that's case, yeah, uh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay. but and then if I if I now undergo this transition, I think what happens is that you actually do this. I see. So so what parameter controls the transition? Uh, all the parameters. <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, you know, there's a phase diagram in, in that paper, uh, but, I see. but you know, if you keep the, the ratio uh, between uh, the length of the rotor is constant, you can actually go through that transition by just changing the non-reciprocity. Okay, I see. Or if you keep the non-reciprocity constant, you could also change that. You could also just change the ratio uh, and do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And actually, uh, so here you see that there's a, a topological. You know, a transition in the in the winding. So in the bulk spectrum, they really become different. And before, in what Xiaomi told us, the, the what was topologically distinct was how the eigenvectors wind. You know, when you go through the Brillouin zone. But here, I don't have to look at the eigenvectors to define some form of winding. I can just look at the eigenvalues, because my eigenvalues are not real anymore. They are complex, so they live in a complex plane. So that means I can, you know, <laughs> I can study their winding in the in the Brillouin zone in the complex plane. Okay, and. Uh, that's what you can do with this formula that basically describes how these eigenvalues wind in the complex plane. Right? And in fact, what is really, and what we didn't understand back then, and now we understand, is that at, at first we thought that what really mattered was the winding of, you know, of the eigenvalue, all the eigenvalues themselves, right? So you could see here you, you wind, uh, so if I draw this winding here on the, on the top case, you basically have a, you know, you know, if I if I plot here, uh, imaginary part, real part, uh, Q, right? So I had here two, two, uh, two basically wiggles that would wind. But now in this case, I got a unique one. Right? So we thought initially that that was kind of the nature of the transition, but actually we later understood. That actually, what matters is whether you wind around the mode or not, right? <laughs> So what matters is whether, actually, what, what really tells you, and it's really like this idea of this non-emission skin effect, that's really whether you wind around the mode or not around the mode will determine whether your skin, if your, your non-reciprocal bias will, will have actually uh, control where the mode is, okay? Uh, and actually, so here, uh, the only form of bulk edge correspondence that we see is that, you know, we're, we use topology to actually pin the mode at zero because it's protected and so it leaves at zero. And so that's nice because then it's easy to, you know, uh, to wind or not across that mode, okay? Uh, 
if you like, you can actually convince yourself of this by you know, going to Python, Mathematica, MATLAB, and, and, and see that you can see the same. I'm happy, uh, actually, I made the codes, I think, so if you want, you can always reach out. Uh, here, the difference is that here, when you have this, uh, when you have this uh, two-band system, you actually you know, don't have a, a constant, you have a, a alternating values of coefficients, and that's enough to have a two-band system. Okay? Uh, physically, what it means, uh, you know, you don't wind, you wind. Physically, what it means is that this is the kane lubeski chain, that you, the usual one is passive. The floppy mode is, you know, we, we studied that it was on the side where the spring is more collinear with the rotor. But here, weirdly enough, the skin effect is able, or the, 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 the non-reciprocity is able to move it on the, on the weird side, on the stiff side. Right? I call that the, the non-Hermitian skin effect because that's, uh, that's actually what people in the quantum community call it. And I guess they call it in analogy to the skin effect you have in electromagnetism where the modes, where the current sometimes localized at the edge of a conductor. Uh, and here, it's like a non-emission non version of it. All the, the modes also localized at the edge. OK? We also could do that experimentally. So you could measure, actually, this, this winding, more or less. And you could see that you either wind or not. And, and you know, experimentally, you see that here, on the top, your mode is on the right. But in the bottom, the mode is on the left. it moves more on the left. Yeah. Yeah. So as I was saying, this is, you know, the, the advantage of doing linear physics is that you have many analogies. These are the arduous ways. So uh, this model of, you know, non-reciprocal springs can also be carried over to as non-reciprocal hopping coefficients in electrons. And that actually was a, a, a paper first, in, uh, you know, quite old now by Atano Nelson that introduced this kind of Hamiltonian. And since then has been revisited uh, uh, across different fields of physics in photonics and, and, uh, and cold atoms and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, can you do anything with this? Who cares, right? Uh, what you can do potentially is that you have these waves that amplify only in one direction and attenuate in the other, so you can make useful waveguides that are unidirectional waveguides. So you could, uh, you, could uh, you know, that's what we show here with our system that actually, you know, you have like a, unidirectional flow that is uh, you know, only unidirectional over 50 decibel over five, four decades. So I don't think you could do, any, you could do something like that otherwise. Uh, I think if you want to work with the flexor wave, uh, that's, I think, a uh, group in Missouri who also did that, uh, uh, use a similar concept. A group in uh, Chicago theorists showed that you could actually use that for quantum sensing to amplify more the noise, than the signal than the noise. And people in, uh, in um, Germany, I think, showed that you could also use that to make uh, photonic uh, optical fibers that also uh, transmit uh, waves in one direction. OK? Uh, as Karina said, hey, if you have your wave that amplifies only in one direction, actually, you will hit nonlinearities. So the natural question to ask is what happens when you, when you hit nonlinearities? The answer that we found, so that's what we studied, it took us a while, it's taking us a while to wrap this up. But this is a ring that's periodic, and you have some, it's the same, but then the mechanical is a bit different. You see that because of nonlinearities, actually you're able to stabilize a wave that only goes in one way. And here, there's a real trade off between this amplification, the damping, and a nonlinearity, and the dispersion of the wave. You can show, you can demonstrate that this is actually a breather. A breather is a specific type of soliton uh, that can that can be that can exist in, in a nonlinear material. But here, the difference is that this breather is amplified in one way. Right. No, is there only waves in the stadium uh, like that? <laughs> uh, I don't know if the. Yeah, I guess because when you do this, right, you look at your neighbor, and the neighbor does this. Maybe you do this, but then when you have done it, you look at your neighbor. You know, you never do this, but you already done it. So, so maybe you could think of a, some crowd motion, maybe perhaps as you could potentially describe it like that. Why not? In fact, interesting thought. I don't know. Do you have thoughts on this, Itai? Since you work on crowds, like uh, social interactions could be actually non-reciprocal, and I guess, yeah. I guess most of the 
you know, uh, I don't know if it makes sense to describe it by a, a mass and spring system, but I would, I would imagine if I were to describe like a, you know, mechanically a crowd of people, they probably have some memory of what they've done before, and so they would perhaps do, uh, they would perhaps adjust what they do and what the neighbors do, but differently after and before they did the wave, right? So, yeah, interesting, yeah. So I, I'm trying to think about, like, for these systems, um, what are some of the things that, you know, whenever you implement things in real systems, you learn something about, you know, things that you didn't consider in your model. Yeah. And so w where, where in this system or what, you know, are we, are we getting from the experiment part? Y you know what I mean? I mean, I could have put this on Python. But what yeah. do I get from doing it in the experiment? Um, well, so it, you know, the, I guess it, it kind of guides you in how you should, you know, simulate this because the space of parameters is so large, you could simulate anything. So somehow the fact that you can only build a specific object constrains you in your explorations, uh, and also, you know, like uh, it's not clear which type of nonlinearity you would have to put in. There's so much you could put, right? So I guess it, it, it kind of constrains you in what you could put. Uh, and so that, to me, that's kind of a guides and focuses a bit the exploration. But if you're very good and creative numerical uh, physicist, you could probably do the same. But it, maybe it's, it tells more about my, you know, approach to physics. And <laughs> uh, but but I think it helps us to it helps us to, to constrain. And and I'll I show you later a video of things that I don't think we could simulate so easily. So I guess that uh, makes sense. But but in, in the path to discovery, there's not one way. I don't think you can. I don't think experiments necessarily the only or the best. I think usually a combination is actually quite good. Uh, uh, but here, yeah, the main argument I can give is that it, it, it guides you a bit. Yeah. Um, so this is maybe a, a good way to transit to what? So this is a breather. The breather is nice. Uh, you know, you can map this equation to a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but make it non-reciprocal. And you can, you know, go back to the books of solitons from the 70s and suffer through their you know, inverse scattering theory methods, and, and, and that's what took us so long, right? But now we're <laughs> almost there. Uh, and I guess what, what's really distinct is that this kind of driving had not, considered been, had not been considered before by, you know, people consider this kind of equation in cold atoms, in, uh, in plasmas, but somehow the non-reciprocal driving had not been considered, it seems, or so far as we know. Uh, the breather is nice, but it's kind of tenuous. It only can exist for initial, for a very precise set of initial condition and gain and loss, so you really have to fight for it. So that's why recently, uh, with the help of of, uh, of, um, of Jonas and Schaufe, who's not here now, but uh, we made it topological. So the, the nonlinear wave, the soliton, a breather is a nice nonlinear wave that you know has an equilibrium between dispersion and linearity, gain and loss. Here you can make it topological by using a chain of bistable springs, right? And so here, I agree with you, here we had the idea, we just made it, right? Uh, uh, and actually we made it first in the PDE, uh, uh, but then, but then it's, it is still fun to actually do in the lab. Uh, and uh, you see that you can send this, you know, pulse there uh, that is quite robust. And, uh, and you can, you know, if you alternate in and out, you can send Morse code and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, that, that is nice. I think what you could get from experiments there is that, you know, every magnet here that we use, every elastic band is actually not perfect. So, you know, th this soliton exists for a range of activity, not only one value of activity. Uh, but, you know, it, it, the range over which it exists, I think, is not only limited by nonlinearities, but also, for instance, disorder and things like that. And so, you know, this is a guide to tell us, okay, maybe we should look at, we should look at this order next, right? So I guess that's, uh, that, that's, that's basically the, uh, that's basically the, you know, it, it tells you maybe what are the most, what is the m most relevant parameter to vary. And here, what's interesting, also same, these kinks, so this is actually an implementation of the frankel kontorova uh, equation, which is, you know, the, the same equation I had before, but then a, a sign, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, uh, it had not been considered with this for the, with this odd driving so far. Uh, usually, when you did, it, it had been considered for a constant driving, and usually for a constant driving, your kinks and your anti-kink uh, move in different directions. So usually in the plasma, you get a soliton gas, 
Here, because of the specific type of driving that depends on the gradient of the displacement, kinks and anti-kinks move the same way, uh, which, which is why we can use it as a waveguide. Right? <laughs> so this specific type of non-reciprocal driving also has potential use to make you know, waveguides. Okay. Good. So I have half an hour left. Um, OK. Maybe we take a little break, a couple of minutes. Good, yeah. yeah. You know the switch models? Non-reciprocal non discrete models? Non-reciprocal? Discrete, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm just wondering whether there well, is a nice and simple uh, version. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, uh, we actually, so the, the equation I had before was this one, right? So it was this. You know, plus k. Plus k prime. Yep. All right. And then uh, this guy here, what it does, it does this. Right, so you have nonlinearity. Uh, or the guy before, the guy of the breather, was doing something like. Uh, right, and uh, that's 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 basically the class of models that we can uh, mm -hmm. actually uh, that we use to describe those, right? Yes. Uh, and that yeah, Fr this is Frankel Kuntorova model uh -huh. plus. Driving, I guess. So this is really the. Yes. Yeah. But no, was it your question or? No, no, no. no. So, so, yeah. so, you know, like, mm. A discrete set of variables, like a, a nice invariable or something like that, instead of having ah, continuous. Yeah. Uh, like, well, like, uh, uh, yeah. 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 Well, I think this one you can coarse grain into that, right? Because okay. this one is bistable, uh -huh. so you could potentially, you know, uh, go to the field, you know, z two field. Uh -huh. you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think you can do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, yeah, but there's a. Something that comes to my mind is that yep. those yeah. gases of Janus particles, for instance, yeah. so that you know, from a biological yeah. depending on yeah. what space is facing what. I, I guess you could, you could build something like a very simple, non reciprocal model out of that. But yeah, I, I yeah, know, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm sure, I'm sure you could take it, uh, yeah, 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 you could take oh, it to. Yeah, 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 I mean, the, there's uh, uh, Vincenzo Vitelli, they have done uh, something with the spins. Yeah. Uh, angles. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah, so they did it with spins, non reciprocally coupled, they did that as well. Uh, and then they, they, they describe this kind of flocking and, and, and interesting, uh, interesting phases that can emerge thanks to that. Yeah, I'll. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a really nice report for my PhD. So you can yeah. get a white hole horizon. Effectively, right? So this is like yeah. the opposite of a black hole, where you have yeah. waves propagating only outside, and yeah. inside they are decaying. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's exactly the Helmholtz or uh, the yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, In fact, I, th I think you know a, a question I had because if you have a gradient in stiffness, yeah. so if this one mm -hmm. changes, uh, this one is you know k plus you know k I. prime times i. Then what you get in your PDE is, is, is also this one yeah. as well, right? And then that's like maybe what you, you use to describe. Anom anomalous dispersion. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I've been thinking about, you know, what yeah. if we do both, if we combine this and... Uh, but exactly, and you can and also have cavities and you can... Yeah, 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 yeah. probably. I think there's a lot to do, in fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a lot of... Usually people do these analogs with optics. Because yeah. then you can... They wanted to get quantum parts of it when you have yeah. a modification of quantum. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, vacuum fluctuations, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's yeah, something yeah. I wonder what this could be really useful. Yeah, I, I, maybe wave guiding things, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I think it's an interesting question. I, you don't know where it could take you, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you about? I, I yeah. don't think I got the difference between this and what you were doing before and what. <coughs> 
so here it's, you it's basically just... okay yeah so here basically you have a derivative of v mm. right and in the case before so what you change is the is the shape idea. of v is the shape of v and what you had before the shape of v was something linear like this mm -hmm. uh, in this case the shape of v is this so this is a uh, non harmonic it's cubic so this is uh, really can accommodate uh, breather uh, this one can also accommodate breather because this one is non linear right but you can also have kinks or actually the sign is really this one. but you have like a you can have a two states like a domain wall between two states that's all yeah. that's really what the difference is yeah? the, the, the topology of your energy landscape in which your waves evolves yeah yeah. Do you know if people have studied these kind of elastic chains, considering that the masses are like active Brownian particles, where the active uh, force is like random instead of uh, the one I just showed? I don't know if people have done that. Uh, I know if you go to the limit where k, the elastic constant, yeah, yeah, yeah. is zero, you're gonna have like clusters yeah, yeah. for me. What? What? Then if you turn k, yeah. yeah. Then for some k, I think there should be some sort of transition where the clusters fall apart. Because yeah. the what, what people have done, what we have done, I'll show that later, that you have a force, active force here, mm -hmm. and the active force uh, is, is uh, provoked by an active Brownian particle. Yeah. But then you have to describe the, the polarization, so you have an equation of motion, the polarization of the active Brownian particle. Yeah. And, uh, yes. But on the stiffness itself, I'm not sure. Yeah, on the, you know, uh, yeah. but on the, uh, the yeah. extra force, yes. Yeah, I see. Well, actually, yeah. yeah, considering this kind of active particle, active burning particles like bacteria mm -hmm. and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the orientation randomly yeah, changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? And then you, yeah. you uh. turn on some uh, elastic force between them. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah. But then you would have some form of, you would need some form of feedback mechanism between the state of your displacement and the shape of the, and the, you know, how these particles are aligned or something like that, right? If you no, would want no, anything. That's, that's actually the thing. Uh, without alignment, the simplest okay. kind of active Brownian particle, yep. without alignment, where the random force is completely decoupled. With okay. The okay. I think it would be okay. really interesting. Oh, interesting. Interesting. When you yeah. turn on elastic forces. Okay. Wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. I'll. Uh, <coughs> Okay, let's uh, let's start again, maybe. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> All right. So so far we spent the you know, the, the largest part of the lecture on non-reciprocal spring or you know odd spring that has this you know in, you know non-reciprocal interaction. So I push you, you feel more force than I do, but it's not the only way in which you can be odd, right? And so in the force, in the springs I use, I, I, I don't conserve linear momentum because to, to break this Newton's third law, you actually need to, to, to inject momentum. What you can do is also consider cases where you actually conserve linear momentum. And that's what our, our friends in Chicago, Colin Scheibner and Vincenzo Vitelli actually proposed. So they have this way of being odd, which is distinct from ours, which actually conserved linear momentum. So let, imagine you have a spring like this, and imagine if you compress it, it wants to spin in one way. We have a torque, a, a, a clockwise torque, and if you stretch it, you have a counterclockwise torque. Right. So if you wish, it's kind of a, it would be an odd spring, but it would be a, with some form of chirality, like a chiral odd spring, you could call it. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the, the main difference is that you, you actually don't inject in your momentum. And what, as we will see, if you don't inject linear momentum, you, you keep translation invariance. And if you keep translation invariance, you can actually formulate a theory of elasticity. So not only you can express, think about dynamical matrices, but you can actually, uh, things will only depend on the gradients of displacement. And so therefore, you can formulate, you know, you can revise Hooke's law uh, to take into account this elasticity. And that means that your elastic tensor this time, not the dynamical matrix only, but the, the elastic tensor will become non-reciprocal. Okay? So imagine you take the spring, you make uh, actually a triangle lattice, for instance, with it, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can do actually, we don't have the time, and we're tired, but I had planned this exercise where you actually 
could actually compute the compatibility matrix with that. Uh, and uh, this is what it would look like if you do the, you know, if you do the, the things carefully. Uh, uh, that relates the displacements to the elongation, right? Uh, so this is nice. And uh, you can actually express the, the forces, the elastic forces, by using the transpose of the compatibility matrix that relates to the tension in the springs, right? And what's nice, you can also do the same for the active force, uh, but then you, you use a compatibility matrix that's different because you know this, these forces come from the fact that when you have a tension, it exerts a, a, a longitudinal force on the nodes, but now I have this new odd force that does this, right? So I can, I can still keep my you know, hard work of the compatibility matrix, but now the only thing I have to do is to rotate it because my, my force, my net force on the node are not like this, they are like this, right? Right, so I rotate my compatibility matrix. That's what you get with this uh, rotation matrix here. And then that's nice because I can do, I can run through the machinery of expressing my dynamical matrix. So usually that is the, you know, the passive part, so the transpose of C times C. But now I have the same with this active part, which is the transpose of C times C. But now I can multiply by this rotation matrix that just does this. Okay? And, uh, as we will see, that rotation matrix, that chirality, that oddness actually, is the part that's responsible for injecting energy. You say active part because it would not be possible to do it without activity. Yes, okay. it's not possible to do it without activity. Yes. Uh, uh, I think so. The, the, the argument that uh, Vincenzo uh, likes to give is that if you stretch this bond and then do a cycle like this, you will because of the clarity of the force, you will create work or dissipate work depending on the sequence in which you do this. A bit similar to the argument I gave to, to, uh, to Colin right, later. Yeah. Okay, now that you have your dynamical matrix based on this, it's nice. You can uh, you know, use these plane weight onsets uh, that we've used in 1D, but now it's a bit more annoying because you have to do it in 2D, right? But then you get this, you know, uh, two by two block dynamical matrix in, in Fourier space. And you see that here you have a minus sign, so I'm non-symmetrical, <laughs> right? So I'm happy I'm non-symmetrical. Because I'm non-symmetrical, my waves are not only have a real imaginary frequency, but they also have an imaginary part to it. And so this is the you know, dispersion relation. Uh, you, know, you plot image real and imaginary part as a function of the two wave vectors, Q1 and Q2, that define your volume and zone, OK? Uh, you can do it for when the dynamics is actually uh, inertial, but you can also do it when the dynamics is overdamped, when you know you have only a first derivative here. And what you find is when you're inertial, same story, half of the waves blow up, half of the waves decay. When you're overdamped, uh, it's interesting because uh, all the waves die, but they die with the imaginary part, with the real part. So that means they are not you know, you, your dynamic is overdamped. You don't have inertia. You don't have usually uh, waves are a balance between inertia and, and, uh, in, um, and uh, elasticity. Now I don't have inertia. But nonetheless, because of this on reciprocity, I still have some oscillations, so I have decaying oscillations. So, uh, OK? That, that's basically what you, what you get. Yeah? Small question. The rotation yeah. of the compatibility matrix that you um, yeah. showed us, is it? the most generic algebraic way of preserving momentum? No. OK. No, it's one way. I mean, I think here, uh, I think here the, the, the idea was to be, uh, you know, again, uh, as lazy as possible. Do it okay. find the simplest way to illustrate your point, I guess. Yeah. OK, so that's, that's nice. As I told you here, an interesting way to think about, uh, it's interesting to think about the continuum limit, because then you can think about elastic waves. And so when you do that, uh, you get, you know, your your equation on the displacement that's, you know, equal to your elastic tensor times the, the, the gradient of your of your, uh, of your displacement, and yeah, you have the same that comes from the elastic part. What you can use is actually uh, uh, the Fourier dynamical matrix to actually de derive expressions for those. But actually, what you find so this is a bit uh, uh, not very easy, but basically what what you find is that y you know this basically. Uh, the sum of C and C prime make up the elastic tensor, right? And what they did is that they showed that actually this is the simplest way in which you can write your elastic tensor. 
So you have you know, uh, dilation relates to pressure, shear stress relates to, uh, shear strain relates to shear stress, and shear strain in the other direction relates to shear stress in the other direction. Usually you only have the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. Now we have this odd modulus that relates, you know, you shear in one direction, it creates stress in the other direction, right? So if you have a material like this, what it means is that if I compress, it shears, but if I shear, it extends, which is a bit strange, right? Uh, and which is ex exactly does the same thing as, as we discussed with the, the unique particle. So that means that whether you shear first and then, com and then, and then uh, compress or compress first and then shear, then you will either dissipate or do work. Okay? The argument, the fact that you can either do this and this, and in one way you have to inject work, implies that you need energy input to do this. Yes. Yeah. So what we did actually, we you know we had our odd springs that were not Carroll. They had their theory that was Carroll, but no experiment. So we said, hey, let's do something together. So that's what we did. And so our, our uh, uh, and, and this was done with my former postdoc Martin Borden Bourget, who's, who's now a senior in Marseille, uh, Jonas, who's now a PhD in the group, and Colin and Vincenzo. And what you see is that. Actually, uh, if, you, if you connect them in a specific way, and if you let them float on the table, you can also, you need not inject linear momentum, if you, depending on how you configure those guys. And so that means that you, you can actually realize a, a version of this scarrow of springs here that realizes its tensor. Okay, and so that's what I will discuss in the rest of the presentation. And I'm realizing I don't have a lot of time, but imagine, uh, and. Imagine you, you take uh, a ring of these guys and uh, you make you program them to be odd. What happens is that this object actually deforms, but you know as we said, it's odd elastic. So when it deforms, it shears, and so since it's be, since it's sheared when it's deformed, it actually bounces back with an angle. Okay, if you change the sign of the activity of the oddness, it does it, but the other way, right? And actually, if you track the, you know, the, the shear de deformation of this blob, you actually see that you have a hysteresis uh, whose sign depends on the sign of the activity. Uh, on top of that, what's also interesting is that, well, this is basically uh, what happens during the impact. Sorry, uh, Colin, yeah. this is, this is the, uh, what type of system are you, simu are, are you studying now, in the sense that, that experimentally speaking? Uh, this is, is really the, this the, is really the one the, that uh, Vincenzo the, has proposed? No, no, this is really like a mix between what they have proposed and what we have proposed, in a way. The, but that still realizes this other uh, elasticity. So this is really these bonds, the, the, the two particles, the, the three bars. The non reciprocal yeah. one that you yeah, were showing the before. One. But if you arrange that in a ring, actually it creates a blob that is itself other elastic. Ah, yeah. OK. Uh, what happens that, you know, this is the impact. It, it uh, deforms under its own inertia. Because of this odd elasticity, it kind of shears, and because it shears, it bounces back on one foot, and because it bounces back on one foot, there's an angle and a spin to it. If you track the dynamics, what's interesting is that actually you see that there is also waves that are pro tending to propagate one way. So actually the internal dynamics beyond you know, the two lowest shear modes of this object uh, is reminiscent of the non emission scale effect that I described, okay? You can actually write uh, the equation of, you know, that would describe flexural waves in this object, and you see that the neon reciprocity here would introduce not the first derivative as we had, but the fifth derivative as we had, and this will have a very similar effect uh, than this one that we had here. It amplifies the waves in, in one direction and, and as it attenuates them in the other. Okay? Uh, that's an exercise I had planned, but no time. You can also show that waves amplify in one direction and attenuate in the other when you do that. Okay, uh, you can, you know, we use like an active particle on the passive wall, you can do the converse, you can have a make a pa an active wall uh, on which you smack a passive object. So this, this is what will build all these, uh, you know, robots. Uh, we have about 150 of them now. Uh, and so that's what it looks like in the lab, it's huge, <laughs> one meter per one meter. Uh, and you can do those experiments where you can actually study the impact of a projectile 
but you see that the object will be deflected and you will have this kind of wave also skin, non-emission skin wave because you see that the waves tend to be amplified in one direction rather than the other. Okay? You can use, so what you can do uh, to describe this is to, you know, uh, open the Landau Lipschitz of elasticity and revise the theory of Rayleigh waves, but then with the odd, with the odd tensor, and you can demonstrate that the Rayleigh waves now are not only surface waves that are exponentially localized at the surface, but they're also exponentially skewed in one direction, okay? And that, that's kind of, so you predict that there's a wave vector uh, that is, has, again, this asymmetry, and indeed, that's also kind of what you see uh, in the data. You can also do the same with a response to a point particle, so you can, op again, open your lander loop sheets, make your elastic modulus uh, odd, and you can see that, you know, the response to a point indentation will have this asymmetry, and somehow you can also rationalize why the object deflects thanks to that. Okay? The idea that you were mentioning that you shear the system and it expands. Yeah. Can we see in this, uh, in this system? Uh, yeah, you can kind of see, but it, the resolution here is a bit poor. Uh, but maybe on, on the previous video it's better. If I play it here, oh. Uh, it's, yeah, you see that actually the hexagons that are below, you know, they, they uh -huh. under, under the, the projectile, they will be a bit sheared, in fact. Yeah. Uh, and because you, pre you, you are only pressing and they, uh, and they look like a shear, isn't it? Yeah. You see, if I have it here. Yeah, you see here the project. So it's really, we are really, a, it's a shock wave, really. A, this is the, but you see that here, after the shock wave, you see that this, you have this coupling between the two shear directions. That's really is responsible for the object. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. If you yeah. It's it's not very super strong, right? But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's there. Yeah. Um, let me just. So now I I promised you some robotics, but we didn't do anything. We just looked at linear response. And so in the five minutes I have left, <laughs> I want to just show you that, uh, you know. If you exploit the nonlinear response, we did that for the soliton and the breather, but you can also do that in this uh, object. You have actually patterns that can emerge. Uh, and so that's what happens if you take your particle here and uh, push the activity enough that, you know, at some point, if you push the activity strong enough, the system will spontaneously oscillate. It will exhibit a limit cycle that is controlled by a Hopf bifurcation. And so then what you can do is actually uh, well, exploit this to make an object that itself moves, um, but it moves by itself on the table, uh, and then uh, you can, uh, you know, couple it to the environment. So you can, you know, uh, you can uh, you can actually you know, see that this object moves by itself. Okay, there's actually a very interesting. Uh, Nonlinear dynamics that occurs with inverse cascades like you have in turbulence. I don't have the time to talk about this, uh, but we're, I, and we're still actually trying to figure out what happens in, in the systems. Uh, but, uh, but so what I will just show you is once you have this object, it tends to be, you know, it, it, it's compressed by gravity. And then because of this shape changes between the two shear direction of these objects, uh, you can actually uh, uh, use that for, uh, for to make, to reinvent the wheel, basically, right? Uh, and I guess to come back to uh, Itai's question, you know, the stuff before we could simulate, but now if you, this object is, you know, it's nice because it, in principle, can locomote in complex terrain. This is on, you know, grains, and so it would be a lot harder to actually simulate this, I think, uh, right? Um, It's, go it's going to come back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> okay, I can play it another time. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and see here, in comparison to these time-modulated uh, robots, 
you know, a lot of people make time modulated robots. When you do that, you really have to control very finely the clock, the, the frequency at which you do this. Here, since the dynamic emerges from your limit cycle, the system adapts and chooses itself the frequency at which it does this. And so, for instance, we actually benchmarked it against time modulated version of this, where the thing, you know, no, can go fast, but it doesn't know even how to accelerate, because when you accelerate, you first have to go slow, and then when you go slow, your clock, your oscillation time is actually not in tune with how fast you should go, right? So, but this object is able to actually seamlessly uh, accelerate. Uh, it's interesting, as, as Andrea was making, you know, it's robust, so you can, you know, turn off some of the, some of the guys, it, it looks a bit, uh, it's having a hard, harder time, but it still goes, right? Uh, and uh, well, you, you can also uh, be a, a bit more uh, mean to your object. You can cut it all together, and then it doesn't roll anymore, but it can crawl. Uh, and that's what we have here. And so you can make it crawl on an easier terrain, on a, on a flat, on a, you know, in a tunnel. My videos are not super optimized for a short presenter, but essentially you get the idea, it just moves around, right? right. Uh, you can also do that with your odd elastic medium, your blob. It's not very efficient, but the guy can still go, right? Okay. Uh, and so where, where is this going, I guess? So the idea is like we have this, we use this uh, active matter, active metamaterial, so really have now the lens of a material science and, and uh, really look at, uh, you know, uh, d using mechanics, ways to describe this object. So I guess, uh, I guess one thing you get, as is exactly the point that I was making, is typically because you have a distributed object, you have more robust and, and adaptable uh, than, than a, you know, a robot, a six-legged six robot that would have to walk, right? So that's potentially where this could be interesting. Uh, and so, you know, we, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of, uh, trying to make more of those, and in the, in the computer, at least, you can simulate, you know, rolling, or uh, crawling, uh, and you have some interesting dynamics inside uh, that actually has some physics of topological defects that we are uh, currently trying to uh, to discover. Okay, so one thing one thing I want to say before I, I conclude is that this is nice, but it's indeed a lot of engineering to make these actuators, to make these Arduinos, and so on. We are becoming good at this. Uh, some other people at Itai really uh, push that really uh, far into the small scale. But you know, it's interesting also to think about the ways in which this feedback between strain in one way and torque in the other could be purely mechanical. So that's, that there's a recent paper uh, in which I was involved, pushed by uh, Olivier Dauchot in Paris, where you actually use just in simple particles, and you see that you have also some form of non-reciprocal coupling between the deformation that the particle active particle exerts on the spring, and the motion or the displacement also of a particle actually reorients that particle, so changes the way it does work, right? And so when you do this, uh, actually you can, you can get some, also some form of limit cycle uh, that could be useful. And so I think trying to go towards this idea of you know, putting as much of the control as possible in the mechanics and, and letting go of the electronics can be useful in some, in some, sense, in some cases, okay? So that's what I want to conclude. You know, uh, I think there's a, you know, active metamaterials are nice. You can make nice waveguides. Uh, it could be useful for, you know, a, a lot of uh, also uh, in the electromagnetism for telecommunication and also uh, energy harvesting, for instance. But I think there's also an interesting uh, room playground uh, to let's say, explore the boundary between uh, robotics and, and active matter in general. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, I think you have discussed today only when you have the odd dynamical matrix part, you yep. don't have the odd damping term. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have the odd damping term, do, 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 what, what kind of new phenomenon can you, can you, can you uh, get? People when? have done this. I think it's connected to this whole viscosity that yeah, actually yeah. was studied in the, in the quantum case before in the 90s. Uh, and I think you also get some interesting coupling between, you know, shear stress, shear strain, in a, shear, uh, you know, a velocity gradient in one direction versus the other. Yeah, so that, that's, that's also, I think, 
potentially uh, interesting. And I think there's, there's a formal analogy between being odd viscosity and uh, that and um, and uh, and the magnetic field, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's a bit analogous to have a magnetic field that introduces a uh, chirality and breaks reciprocity, mm -hmm. but uh, in comp you know in contrast with odd elasticity, you don't necessarily need to inject work to actually get this. Just as you know, you don't need to inject work necessarily to, to have a B field. That's the same for odd viscosity. Yeah, and have call yeah you 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 can also uh, people have been trying to you know realize this. Uh, or you know, make it passive, for instance, uh, you know, realize those concepts with you know, trying to get some work out of the viscoelasticity to make it uh, uh, odd elastic, but not having to inject energy, just take away the energy from the viscosity. So I think that's what people are trying to do also. Yeah. Thinking about this, the, the, the application in the Mars rover, um, you when once you impose the, the this non reciprocity in one direction, mm -hmm. the total material, the, the ring that you create, mm -hmm. can only go in one direction. It's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, could you imagine to do something that would uh, be able to? You, you, I mean, you could you yeah. could change the the yeah. non reciprocity yeah, from yeah, one yeah. side to another. Yeah. Well. We actually can change it. We just have you know control of the computer, right? Okay. Uh, but I guess uh, I guess what what I think your question is maybe a, a bit more broad, where you can say you know you have like a, a, d a dynamical system that has some you know basin of attractions, and I think can you know have a s certain cycles of shape change, and and it's interesting to think about how you know once you have identified a good one, can you hop or can you select mm -hmm. between different ones? You know, yes. it's a bit like us when we decide to walk or run. I guess we maybe select a, a, a limit cycle, mm -hmm. and then somehow the brain gives you a cue that tells us, okay, we should change the way we walk, I guess. And so one, one concrete way in which I, I start to think about this is in this one, for instance. You know, when you have like the, this material, uh, it can easily crawl or roll, in fact. And what mm -hmm. we have is that if you change a bit the gravity, it could go either crawling or walking, right? And somehow it's interesting to think about could you give it, you know, how could you design it such that, you know, just by giving some form of mechanical cue, I don't know, I pet it twice there or once there, then it decides to walk or to crawl or to roll, right? And I think this is an open, uh, uh, an open question, at least for us. Uh, I think people in the field of biorobotics actually do that, uh, do that uh, already. So what maybe sets this apart is that this is really like a distributed object with you know, translation invariants that you can describe with tools of continuum mechanics and dynamical systems. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we were discussing this before, uh, there was this question of should you use control or let the behavior emerge? Mm -hmm. And, um, but now I'm thinking, I mean, why, why not just combine the two? I mean, you, yeah. you could easily have you know, a controller that changes your, you know, the yep. state, the, the, the dynamics in your yep. system. Yep. And then you could use that controller to, you know, optimize some behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, 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 I think that's... And right. then there's another controller that would, that would be above that telling you which local local state you might be in. Yeah, 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 no, no, I think so. And I think that's what so uh, that's what like maybe some animals do, right? Say they have maybe more autonomous dynamics that don't re don't need the brain to actually work, right? I know the heartbeat doesn't really rely on the brain, I guess. Uh, but then sometimes there's a, like a, a cue from the brain, right? So you see that uh, you see that there's a stair so you, you change the way of walking. And so I guess we could also implement that uh, here, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess the challenge we try to do is to keep it as simple as possible, uh, right? So I guess maybe the question is there is, if you want to do more, you have to, you have to add a level of control. What's the you know, simplest, most minimal way to do this that requires the least power or least transfer of information, perhaps? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, but. but but I think, uh, but, and maybe that's something that you need to do if you ever take this to a you know, specific application later on, maybe. Yeah, I but I mean, when people think about yeah. sort of central pattern generators or yeah. even, you know, 
locomoting animals, do they, do they talk about it in this way? Um, yeah, yeah I, think they, I think they kind of do. The only thing I think they don't do is to kind of try to describe those objects as you know, spatially distributed objects with partial differential equation and so on, which is kind of the game we're playing here. Uh, but I think they, they exactly, you know, in kind of a, they, they, they use this language of, you know, dynamical system bifurcations, uh, basins of attract, dynamical basins of attraction that can be controlled by, a, you know, a controller, which is the brain. Yeah. So I think to, do, to some extent they do that uh, already, or they have done that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so uh, that's also something we're trying, we're currently grap grappling with, like what is, what, is, what is so different about this than what has been done. And I think, you know, so the, the pattern generators, central pattern generators also have some form of robustness because they use this limit cycle that adjusts its frequency. Uh, but I think this idea of having spatial, you know, redundancy, you know, uh, having like many degrees of freedom uh, that maybe brings the adaptability and robustness has not been explored too much, to, as I understand, right? Uh, yeah. Danilo, that is. Hi. Uh, I'd like to hear more about your design process. Do you? How? How? How is your creation? Do you? Think more about the applications, and then you re reverse. How how is it that? Uh, here, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I think we're just trying out stuff, and you know. So you know, I guess the the, the initial uh, the initial game here it was not really smart. I guess we said, hey, we want all the elastic material. Let's make it. And then, you know, once we make it, you know, you, you start to play with it in the lab, you bounce, you, you whack it against the wall, or the thing becomes unstable, and then it starts to roll, right? So this is, was, design process was more like uh, us toying in the lab, I guess, for this one, right? Uh, yeah, but which, which is actually the, the fun part, but not always. For instance, for the soliton, we know, but we know nonlinearities are going to, you know, so we make a hypothesis, I guess. Uh, which is okay, how you know nonlinearity should tame the skin effect? How does it do it? Can we control it? So there it was more maybe systematic, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, but we're not really uh, designers. We don't have really a specific application in mind. So I guess the field is not really ripe for that yet. I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe at some point we'll maybe at some point we we'll understand enough that you can think of using that as a as a design tool and and, and be a bit more systematic about it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we are kind of in the same thing, but from the design po po point of view first. So, yeah. cool, a, a, a very nice work. Thanks. More questions? Okay, thank you very much, Kohanta. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We have you. lunch break now. Oui, 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 ça... On ne voit pas trop en fait, le, le funny thing là.